Hey everyone, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm being socially distant. I'm David Ronchek. I'm head of open source machine learning strategy here at uh, Azure, and I'm here to talk to you about um, statistics and uh, what they can do in uh, uh, to attack you, uh, specifically machine learning and the way that um, uh, you know folks need to start thinking about machine learning for uh, from a security pr prospect. So with that. Uh, let's begin. Okay. Um, so Microsoft has been in the security business, or excuse me, in the ML business for a long time. And this is something we're really quite proud of. Um, we've done enormous work in vision and speech and language. Um, you can see some of the benchmarks that we helped launch uh, recently. Uh, and of course, we do give them all back to the open source. Um, but most of all, we use them in our products as well. Uh, virtually every product at Microsoft has some form of machine learning included, uh, from consumer to enterprise, open source, uh, applications, um, uh, operating systems, gaming, office, and of course, Microsoft Research. ML interacts with nearly every one of the businesses that, that uh, make up Microsoft and Azure. And the reality is the reason we have to do this is because we need things at such enormous scale, there's really no alternative but to use ML to accomplish it. In this case, um, you know, we have over 180 million monthly active users that engage with Office ML tooling. Um, and 18 billion questions asked of Cortana and 6.5 trillion security events are analyzed every single day on behalf of our users. The numbers here, the amount of data is in fact so large that there's simply no way that we could accomplish any of this without using tools like machine learning. Um, sorry. Um, so that's great, and that's something certainly that I love to talk about, talk about all the ways that we're doing it. But when you look at the average user and what they're interacting when they see ML, they see all these great headlines about how machine learning is changing the world and bringing things forward. Yet on the other side of it, um, they realize that ML is really hard. It's a lot of really challenging math. Um, it's very complicated models. It's hard to get right. And one of the biggest reasons that it's so hard to get right is because so much of the time, the news, the articles, and things like that cover this, the building of a model. And don't get me wrong, building a great model is very hard, and it is core to the overall machine learning experience. But it's not the only part of the overall machine learning experience. The reality is, is that most machine learning exercises look much more like this, where there's long chains of various microservices built together that are designed to solve domain-specific problems, whether or not they impact data, validation, splitting, how you train, how you roll out, how you measure the rollout when it's reached production, and then how you take all that information and fold it back into the original. That is what makes up machine learning, not just building a model. And so let's say you're a data scientist, you're like, well, no, really, I only care about building a model. But the reality is you care about those things too. Because if you don't focus on how to bring that model forward into production, you, you have tweets like this come about, where it takes three weeks to develop the model, which is great, but then it takes another 11 months to get the thing out the door. And that's obviously not ideal. Data scientists, just like anyone else, want to see their tools being used in production and not just being used uh, locally on their own machines. So the answer to this that the community has begun to snap to is something called MLOps, machine learning operations. And the idea here is to merge these two disciplines together. On the left-hand side, you might have a machine learning iterative loop where someone is going through all of those steps, ac acquiring the data, uh, uh, building it into featureization, uh, tokenizing it, uh, then building the model and going through and making sure that the accuracy and the other statistics are there as you would want. But then you fold them into your standard 
GitOps or DevOps pipelines, where it becomes part of your overall um, uh, source tree, uh, you build it into applications, and then you roll it out using the same tools you would use to roll anything else out. And th this kind of integration is incredibly important. To date, most often, machine learning and data scientists have really been left out on an island. They sit in that first circle, and when it's time to move it forward to development of you know, inclusion in the main application or rolling out to operations, you know, it's, it's throwing it over the wall and hoping that it works. If you do use something like MLOps, you actually get a whole bunch of benefits. You get ob uh, automation and observability, being able to know exactly what is ending up in production, including things like reproducibility and verifiability. You get validation. If, if that code actually becomes part of your overall validation framework, you're able to do things like uh, A-B test, roll out canaries. Uh, you're able to do explanations on that, that code and make sure that it's you know, avoiding bias uh, and so on. And then finally, you get reproducibility and audibility because the only thing that made it out to code was the things that were checked into your overall source tree and pushed through a pipeline. Uh, you're able to make sure that you know exactly what your customers saw instead of uh, having you know uh, someone SSH into production and and drop a random binary on there. You know that the only thing that the only thing that had permissions to roll out was this centralized pipeline. And all of this together combines to give you velocity and security, but for machine learning. So uh, with all that as the groundwork, uh, you may be asking yourself, wasn't this supposed to be a talk about security? And in fact, it is. Uh, machine learning operations, ML ops, is the baseline for security. Um, now, you, you're saying to yourself, but it's just math. Machine learning is just math. It's fancy statistics. How bad could it be? Um, we're going to talk about three uh, attacks that have come forward in the past few years and how you might be able to use something like machine learning operations to defend yourself against them. So the first is your attacker gets your machine learning to lie to you. How do you, do, uh, how do you avoid this? Well, we're going to go through and build ourselves a very simple system here. This is going to be a circle detector, a very important machine learning experiment um, that is designed to solve a critical business case. The first thing you do is you start with something like an ingestion step, and then you take it to an engineer step. So in, in that ingestion step, you're going to be pulling in a large amount of data, and you're going to want to split it. You're going to want to have a training set, a testing set, and then a holdback set. And you do that set, or you do that split very intentionally, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to train on your test or your verification uh, or holdback set. Uh, you always want to have those completely separate from your overall process. Uh, you take that, you move the training data into uh, your, your train pipeline, and then once it's done uh, training, you verify it against your test or your holdback sets, and then you roll it out to a serving endpoint. So this is very common, prototypical kind of um, uh, machine learning pipeline here, and this can all be driven by something like MLOps. So we're going to build a circle detector. Well, like I said, the first step is you're going to go out and you're going to collect a whole bunch of examples of circles. Here's a whole bunch, they have different sizes, different colors, different positions, uh, and you throw it in there and you build your great model and you say you train, and then you present uh, that circle and you say, hey, uh, is this a circle? And the machine learning model says, yes, fantastic, we're done, right? Uh, unfortunately, of course not. So now I'm going to come along and I'm going to present it with a new example. In this case, I'm presenting it with this thing, and it looks like a square to me, but I don't know. Let's see what the model says. The model says it's a circle. Well, that's crazy town. Why, why did I, you know, what did I do wrong? These look very, very different. One is round and blue. The other one's green and looks like a square. Uh, how could this possibly be mistaken? Well, it turns out that if you look at a square, uh, all the pixels that make up a circle are inside the square. All right. Well, I, you know, that seems pretty straightforward to me. That's why the machine learning model ended up figuring out it's a circle. What I didn't do as part of my training was identify all these bits around the edges here that are not a circle and inform the, the uh, machine learning model that that was the case. Uh, and so what I needed to do was not just have a bunch of you know, positive cases that showed that this was the case, but I also needed to show negative cases uh, where this wasn't the case and hand those both to the machine learning model in order to get an accurate model. Okay, so obviously that's just a toy example. Real advanced models are much better than this, surely. 
Here is uh, a wonderful uh, paper, uh, and and by the way, during this process, I, I've been you know incredibly lucky to read so many interesting papers. Don't feel like you have to write them all down. At the end, I list every paper that I rent mention here uh, in a big long list for your screenshotting pleasure. All right, so here uh, is a paper um, uh, came out of uh, UCI, I believe. Um, where they did a wolf versus husky detector, which is obviously quite critical if you want to, um, you know, keep your sheep safe or reindeer, as the case may be. So um, in this case, they presented a series of wolves and huskies to the uh, detector, um, and they only got one wrong. That's pretty good, right? This is a pretty complicated thing. How are you going to figure this out? Well, it turns out um, that they came along and in, in created an entire framework for identifying what's going on here, and, and it's called exp explaining what's going on under the hood. And as you start to look at it, you kind of, you're, you're like, hey, what is happening here? When I go and look at the husky picture, it, it's actually got pieces, pixels of the husky that make the difference here. Here's another one. But when I look at the wolf, the funny part is, is the wolf makes up almost none of it. It's all these little bits around the edge. What happened? Well, it turns out that we didn't detect whether or not there was a wolf in the picture, he detected whether or not there was snow in the picture. And because the correlation between snow and wolves was so high in these pictures, uh, that's what the machine learning model determined was the right thing. Uh, so, and we're just getting started here, right? That, again, that's, that's where you have explanations. What happens in something like this? Uh, Tumblr recently came along and wanted to uh, start excluding not safe for work content. Uh, and their models had all kinds of things, uh, very publicly, unfortunately. Uh, they had a whole bunch of false positives. Uh, this is fried chicken, or excuse me, uh, raw chicken here. This is a cartoon of a unicorn. Uh, and this is uh, boot cleaners, uh, which they determined were false positives. They also found a bunch of false negatives. Uh, the green here is, is a substitute for uh, something that is actually not safe for work. Um, but when you took that and you layered on top and something that was totally orthogonal, in this case, just an owl, uh, the machine learning model trained on the wrong thing. And so adding this, without this, it, it said no. Uh, but with this, it said yes, that's clear to go. And that's an, another example where simply adding something on top now makes it much harder. And now I think you can see where the attack vectors start to come in. Because what you're able to do is, if you are able to figure out the underlying nature of that model, uh, and figure out what really matters to the model. If you can figure out like, oh, really what it cares about is snow, not the wolf, then you can start layering in additional information uh, that starts to fool the model and starts to do bad things. So in this case, for example, uh, you have a stop sign and some researchers have layered some real world stickers across it. Uh, and in this case, they have a turtle where they 3D printed uh, some additional coloring on top of the turtle's shell. Uh, and in this case, because they layered these stickers on, what was being detected as a stop sign is now being detected as a speed limit sign. And this turtle is now being detected as a rifle. And again, you know, no model is perfect. You're always going to have mistakes, but this kind of stuff starts to get into really serious issues. Here's another wonderful paper um, uh, by some researchers at Google uh, where they took uh, standard pictures of uh, researchers, um, uh, in this case, this is Jeff Dean, and these are the two researchers who actually worked on it, uh, and simply by layering over the top these uh, glasses, this is all done in computers, not in uh, real life, um, uh, excuse me, it's all done digitally, it's not, uh, these aren't physical artifacts, they were able to convince the machine learning model that they were in fact completely different people. Jeff Dean, be, you know, became uh, Mila Josevich, uh, this researcher became a different researcher, and this became Carson Daly. Uh, now, while we would all like to be Carson Daly and Mila Josevich, uh, I think we all can agree that this is a pretty bad security uh, implications. Um, and it's obviously not just for, you know, kind of neutral situations like this. Uh, you may have seen a lot of stuff in the news recently about um, uh, face detection algorithms and identification. Uh, and, and it falls into giant classes. In this case, Amazon's face recognition system falsely matched 28 members of Congress with mugshots. Um, and, and that kind of stuff happens all over the place. And the worst is, it's not just something that you opt into. In this case, you're at an airport where you actually can't opt out at all, uh, which is obviously terrible. Uh, and again, you know, just to take it even further, um, you, there's a, a technique out there called federated learning, 
where the idea is you're starting to be able to provide privacy and and uh, not have to pass back an enormous amount of data to that central server to do your training on. Uh, but in fact, re security researchers have even begun to attack that as well and show where the flaws are. In this case, the way it works is pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll have your training step, but instead of doing all your training here, uh, where you had to input all your data, what you'll do is you'll break the model into a bunch of different pieces and hand one of those pieces to the individual. They will train on their local device uh, without passing any information back, and then they'll just pass the weights back. Um, that's my uh, visual pun there. Uh, they'll pass the weights back to the central server to aggregate and use going forward. And then that central server aggregates all those weights together, creates a model, and is able to push down that model. Now, in a lot of ways, this is fantastic, right? Uh, none of these three individuals passed back uh, any private information. They did all their training locally. And the, the central machine learning model didn't know about that data, so it's able to pass back uh, an improved model without, making any change, without knowing anything about the individuals. Unfortunately, uh, what happens when you get a bad person here? So here on the left-hand side, we have that you know, uh, evildoer who has uh, swooped in. They get past a model. And the, instead of passing back accurate weights, they're going to pass back something that they've figured out how to poison that central model. And then it doesn't just poison them, but it, in fact, poisons the entire model. This is not great. Uh, because now these people who did nothing wrong and, and are off using the model um, on their own, uh, don't know, you know, don't realize they're using something poisoned. Worse, the central authority here, the training system, doesn't know anything bad either because it had already broken all the model up and and uh, handed it out. Uh, this is why we can't have nice things. So there are additional techniques that are coming along to help uh, detecting these malicious clients. Here's a fantastic paper uh, by some of the folks at WeBank. But the reality is that um, uh, you're never going to be able to stop everything. Um, there are lots of tools here. You can build in more edge cases. You can detect bad data. Uh, you can use better evaluation metrics. Don't just look for snow. Look actually for wolves. Uh, you can use different models. Things like uh, one-hot um, models are, are much more defended against this because they're not as granular. Um, additionally, you should really be attacking your own models first. You should be doing a lot of alerting and monitoring. And most importantly, you want to do continuous training uh, where you pull back all the findings that you're having in production back to your original ingestion step and augment that as an additional set of features. Um, now, with all that said, um, there are some pretty big rules here. As For as much as you're going to augment it, you really, this, this third, second point is really what I want to stress. The more impact your model is going to have in the world, the more scrutiny you need to deploy, uh, deploy against it. Meaning, if you're just saying you know, whether or not something is uh, a, a circle or a square, not the end of the world if you get it wrong. And someone can ask the question 10 times, and so be it. If you're detecting whether or not someone should go to jail, uh, that needs to be looked at with a whole ton of scrutiny. Um, but the, what I really want to get at here is the only way to build this in a repeatable way, uh, excuse me, in a, in a reliable way, is to build it using a fast and modular pipeline. So let me show you what that might look like and why this gives you benefits. Um, in this case, building a pipeline goes to three steps, basically. First, you want CI/CD. Most folks have this already. You can use something like GitHub Actions or Jenkins. Second, you add in modular components. You want them to be very loosely coupled, and, and so you can add and remove them as it makes sense to you. Monoliths here are your enemy. You really don't want to do that. Um, and you can mix and match, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. Um, but, but don't think about this as all just one thing in one cloud. Uh, mixing and matching is perfectly OK. Uh, we also have an entire array of uh, actions for doing this on uh, mlops-github.com. And you should go check that out. And then third, and this is really important, measure, measure, measure. I cannot stress that enough. The more that you measure, the better off you'll be. And um, it's up to you to catch these things before you know, you're on the front page of the New York Times, because your models will go stale quickly. Uh, so the more that you continuously train, the better off. So to, to lay this out in a kind of uh, rough architecture format, uh, 
let's say you start up here with something like Visual Studio Code, and you're just going to do that iterative loop that I was talking about earlier. You check that into a code source repository. In this case, I'm going to highlight Git, uh, GitHub, excuse me, but it could be any code source repository you like. And then you plug that into your overall CI CD system. In this case, we're going to talk about GitHub Actions, but anything that allows you to have that microservice oriented um, uh, action and, and basically have triggers from code uh, will put you in a great spot. From there, you're going to kick off your pipeline. So we talked about already uh, processing data. That might occur on your CI CD runner. Maybe you do something big like feature engineering, and that's what you're really going to want to do on something uh, like Spark, which has its own cluster. It's completely OK to have that outside of your overall pipeline. In this case, this feature engineering step reaches out to Spark and executes that pipeline on Spark. And then when Spark is done, it hands back to that course uh, thing saying, hey, you know what? I'm done. And maybe it hands back the data. Maybe it just hands back a pointer to the data. Oh, I'm being hosted on this Azure blob or this GitHub, or excuse me, this uh, S3 bucket or you know, on this NFS file share. Uh, we might do the same thing for the actual training. You certainly don't want to do that in your runner itself. You'll probably want to do that on an external cluster or a hosted service like Kubeflow. Um, and then maybe you go through packaging. Packaging is small. It's throwing it into a container. You can do that in your runner. And then it comes to serving. And in this case, we're going to use a hosted service because it's globally distributed and, you know, five nines uptime and so on and so forth. We'll use something like Azure Machine Learning. But again, could be any uh, cloud that provides it. You'll also want to take all of the inputs and outputs here and store them in an immutable metadata store that you can, so you can always go back and figure out what it is. But this is it. This is really the standards of a pipeline. And this is something that, you know, folks are already doing today. Uh, you know, very, very powerful stuff. And it just matters that you want to bring that same sort of learning that you have from all of your other application and development rollout to machine learning. Now, what is one of the benefits here I mentioned is the loose coupling, meaning you can add and subtract things wherever you like. Again, here's our standard pipeline. Let's say I want to go out and implement an explainer, like that thing that it showed it was the snow that was being detected, not the wolf. Well, if this was a monolithic thing, uh, I would have to go and tear apart one of these components and figure out what was going on before I could move forward. In this case, because I've built it, thinking about these as microservices, using external things to layer on top, I'm able to just add that explainer. In this case, I'm running it on an external machine. And I add it, add the start and finish into the overall pipeline. And so without doing anything significant, I'm able to just pass it from one step to another um, using the standard flow that I've already done. Cool. So that's the, you know, you get your ML models to lie to you. Let's talk about some even more terrifying things. In this case, an attacker takes your model. Now, what a malicious user is trying to do here is they're trying to reproduce the original model. Um, and, and basically, you know, the first goal is really just private access. Um, meaning if they can make a copy of your model with some degree of accuracy, 70, 80%, that's more than enough to begin you know, further activities, right? Uh, maybe they want to uh, do a more complete abstraction la or extraction later after they have a lot more information about the model. Uh, maybe they want to extract private information that you've built into the model. Uh, and I'll show you how some of that stuff leaks through in a minute. Uh, or maybe they want to use this model to construct those adversarial examples that I showed you earlier. Uh, that, you know, being able to build out what a turtle should look like or how to you know, make Jeff Dean look like Mila Josevich is a really hard problem. Um, you need to, you're gonna be, have to execute hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of queries against your model to do that. If you're doing that against a public endpoint, that's not great, that's much more easy to detect. Um, now the reality is extraction is really hard to defend against, but let me show you how this works, and then we'll talk about what you can do around it. So I'm gonna talk about two main attacks right now. Uh, the first is called a distillation attack, and the second is called a model extraction attack. So a distillation attack is really straightforward. The first thing you're going to do is, uh, let's say you have a model over here on the left-hand side. It's a black box model. We don't know what's inside it. Uh, in this case, for the sake of argument, uh, the attacker doesn't even really know uh, what it's supposed to, to uh, uh, detect. So in this case, we're going to start handing examples. In this case, first, I'm going to hand it a heart. And it says, oh, that's no. Uh, now I'm handing it this uh, Pentagon. And it says, yes. All right, well, it's beginning to detect something. Um, so as an attacker, the first thing I'm going to do is start handing it a, a lot more. And I'm starting to give the shape of roughly what it's trying to detect. Uh, but really what you need to do is hand it a whole lot of examples. 
And so now we have a pretty good picture of what it's designed to um, detect. Uh, anyone want to take a guess? The answer is it's designed to detect Nina Simone, singer and civil rights advocate. Uh, no, in fact, it's not. It's, of course, designed to uh, detect a triangle. Uh, but now that I've collected this as the attacker, I've collected a whole bunch of examples of where it works and where it doesn't, I'm able to reproduce the model in a pretty accurate way. Uh, and now that means that um, this thing that cost this original organization uh, millions of dollars, hundreds of hours to go and reproduce, I'm able to go and use it for my uh, nefarious purposes. Maybe I create my own endpoint around it. Um, maybe I use it to do some of the things I talked about earlier, extract data or attack or uh, various things like that. Uh, but regardless, I don't need to touch that original model again. Uh, now the question is, is how close do you get to accuracy here when, when I go and do this? And how you know, much is there? Here uh, is an additional search from uh, uh, those authors who put this original paper together. And it turns out that uh, against Amazon's uh, uh, logistic regression model or Big ML's decision tree model, they were able to get to 99% accuracy, even in the most complicated cases of you know, under 5,000 queries. Uh, that ain't good. Uh, because 5,000 queries is once or twice every minute for two days. That's, that's basically noise for anyone who's looking at it from an alerting or monitoring perspective. Now, that, that is a very specific, very generic type, type of attack. Let's talk about a more specific attack against some of the language models that are out there. In this case, it's called a model extraction attack, and it's really, really cool. Um, you might have heard of BERT. BERT is a very popular language model that's come out in the past few years. Uh, it started by um, some folks at Google. Most language models that you see out there today um, are de <clears throat> derivatives of this work. It's really transformative stuff. And in fact, at Google, or excuse me, at, um, at Azure, we use this too. Uh, many of our cognitive services use derivations of these language models behind these very rich APIs um, to do things like language understanding, Q&A, and so on. Now, we've done tweaks on them, but under the hood, you know, the, the same core is there and the same attack will work, um, unless you defend it. So the way it works, the way we're gonna go and attack this model is we're gonna use uh, some of the techniques created by Squad. So Squad is the Stanford Question Answering Dataset. And the idea is you take a set of Wikipedia articles and you train your model on it. And then you ask questions of the overall model. So in this case, I'm gonna say, here, this is an article about prints, and I say, Question, how many instruments did Prince play? And the answer is 27. And as you can see, this is actually a pretty hard question to get because there are instruments all over here. He's talking about guitars and drums and percussions. Um, you know, he played is separate from including 27 instruments. And there are other instruments down here, bass and keyboard. So again, this model is quite sophisticated and it does really cool things like this. Okay, so how are you gonna attack it? Uh, here are two of those articles uh, done by UMass, Google, um, and Northeastern University. Uh, really cool stuff. But the way you're going to attack it is you're going to start with the same thing. You're going to have your model uh, trained on Wikipedia or some corpus of information. Um, and you can attack it either by using random strings. In this case, uh, a, a string that says, how workforce, stop who knew of Jordan at Wood displayed the. Uh, obviously a nonsensical sentence. But BERT and other language models like this are gonna do their best to respond from the corpus that they know. Or they can say unknown, but, but even that gives uh, leaks information as well. So they're saying, for some reason, the model decided that this was a good fit to this. So, all right. Or you can use Wikipedia, the same Wikipedia common set that was trained on, uh, in order to develop the, the back end. And in this case, we're gonna take a bunch of these words and words from all over the Wikipedia data set, mix them up, because we don't know what a real sentence looks like, but it's also gonna give you an answer. And in this case, it goes even faster. So once you've done this, and you've done this a lot, uh, you're able to reproduce the model. And how close you're able to reproduce it? Well, if you give it just 0.1% of the, or excuse me, 10% uh, of the underlying queries, you're able to get at 72% accuracy. If you do the same amount of queries used to train the model, you're able to get up to 86%. And again, this is without knowing anything about the underlying corpus. You're just attacking the model. And this is extremely cheap against some of those data sets that I talked about earlier. Um, uh, you know, here for 62 bucks, I'm able to get set, you know, the sentiments against 67,000 um, uh, uh, queries, which is the amount necessary in order to train the model up here. 
Uh, here's the speech recognition cost. And even to do something incredibly complicated like this, um, you know, it, it costs just a couple grand. Uh, so now I've reproduced this incredibly complicated model that I didn't do any work around. Um, and I've been able to make a reproduce, reproduction on my own. Now, there are ways to defend against this. You can try and detect those queries. You can watermark predictions. So um, it's going to come back and, and give you answers to models um, uh, regardless of whether or not you know, it's, it's an appropriate fit for you. Um, and, and you could query that model and say, hey, you know, does this respond to does the canary fly in the nighttime? If it, if it does, that implies that they have scraped your model. Um, and, and things of that sort. But, but what I want to re repeat here, the most important bit, is that the pipeline is the most important and not the model. Um, building a rich pipeline will let you solve your own business problems, solve domain specificity, uh, do retraining, continuous retraining for more accuracy. It'll give you a better SLA, um, rather than just focusing on the model. Because the reality is, um, if you allow arbitrary access to your model endpoint, it will be stolen. Uh, because for better or worse, a, um, uh, a someone who is stealing your model looks exactly like someone who is just using your model. Uh, they just happen to be, you know, asking it in a very specific way. Uh, to give you, you know, the high level, uh, you want to spend the majority of your engineering time here on this left-hand side, making this incredibly smooth uh, and and powerful and reliable and so on. I'm not saying, you know, just open it up to the entire world. Throttling and other techniques can be quite valuable here. But the reality is no matter how hard you lock that down, um, you're really not going to, like, avoid uh, being stolen. Okay. Uh, moving on to the final attack. Um, uh, we're uh, going to get to a hidden data uh, attack. Uh, and this is really scary stuff. Um, so... Let's say a malicious user comes along and wants to probe into my system to get information about what I trained on. Um, now, they don't have to be logged in at all. They could just query public endpoints, um, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but these look very similar to user behavior. And the worst part about it is the better your model is, the more it's going to leak. There's kind of no way around that. Now, I want to say something else, and this is a really a common thing that happens in machine learning. Uh, machine learning is not at fault here. You were already at fault. You're probably having this problem today, whether or not you explicitly have, know about it or not. But you are having this issue, um, and we'll get to it. And the machine learning just kind of exacerbated it. So some, some example ways that the leakage is coming. Uh, you talk about things like recommendations here. This is uh, ways, and maybe it's recommending something that I've done previously at this time uh, or when I was in this location. Uh, in fact, you know, I wanted to go unionize a bunch of folks. Uh, or maybe it's leaking my network graph. In this case, here you can see uh, this is Twitter, and it's suggesting people for me to follow based on who my friends follow, which is not great. Um, uh, you know, this may be public information, but maybe it's not explicit. It may be private if you don't do the job, the right job of having it, preventing it from leaking through. Um, or uh, we talk about maps. Here's another uh, really bad example. Um, uh, my mapping, my exercise application is recommending a whole bunch of runs for me to go on, uh, which is great until you realize that it's building those maps off the private running data of people in my community. Uh, now, I don't even have to be connected to you. I'm just geographically nearby, and it's telling me where to go. So not great. But uh, there's nothing so bad that it can't be worse, old Irish proverb, uh, to layer on, especially with ML. So this is a technique called secret memorization. Uh, inside your model, especially if you do something like um, a text suggestion, uh, you're going to include a whole bunch of private corpus of information. Uh, and here you can have an amazing XKCD, but let me dive into that just for a second. What you do is here, you're going to type a word in here, let the ruling classes, and then uh, in this case, Google suggests, but any suggestion, any text generation is going to make the suggestion at the re remainder of it. Now, I didn't leak that stuff, right? That was just me typing in emails, but it built a model that took this and said what the rest of it is. And you can imagine if I had access to this information, um, it might be very easy for me to pick apart and say, oh, this, this person is you know, trying to lead a communist overthrow. Um, and, and what happens is, you know, 
you might have to break into someone's email in order to accomplish this, um, but a lot of times you don't because in the background, a lot of these models are beginning to be aggregated together. Because again, the more data you have, the smarter it's gonna be. And that's really troubling. Because you know, while I kind of joke about the communist revolution, these are all pretty real things here, right? Maybe I just type what the start of my address is and it recommends the rest. Uh, maybe it typed the beginning of my phone number or my relationship status. Uh, here I'm putting my credit card. And this is really troubling because uh, the credit card information, the beginning of a credit card is the same across an entire brand of credit cards. Meaning all I have to know is that you use a visa from whatever, Wells Fargo, and it might fill in the rest. Or social security number is another example. Uh, the beginning of a social security number is based on where you were born. This is Florida, for example. So if I go out and say, hey, um, uh, you know, I know that that person is from Florida and I get into their email or something or, or make uh, arbitrary suggestions against its uh, uh, text generation, it will provide the remainder for me. So again, really scary stuff. There has been some work recently about um, uh, how to begin to detect whether or not this happens. And this is, again, I, I highly recommend you read all of these papers. They're just so fantastic. Uh, the way that they do the detection, not prevention, but just detection of if you have leaking, they go and they inject canaries earlier on in your process and say, you know, the random number is 012345 and so on. And then they test for leakage here because they, they were the ones that controlled this string. They were able to fill in the beginning part of this string here and see whether or not the remainder matches. So really cool stuff, great thinking around it. Now, I wanna stress, this doesn't prevent leakage. All it does is tell you how bad it is leaking. And again, like I said earlier, um, the, the real problem here is the better your model performs, the more accurately it's able to guess at what you want to say, the more that it is uh, now a threat to leakage. And there's really no answer there because um, I want it to be accurate. I want it to sound exactly like me. I would love it to fill in my credit card information if I'm doing it. I, don't, I just don't want anyone else to. Um, there's some other work going on right now um, around differential privacy, and I link to the paper later. That's where you encrypt the data on the way in and then do the training on it. And that should be a good start. But again, I can't stress enough, at the end here, your data is still coming out and will have to be decoded and translated for um, end users. And at that point, that's where things begin to leak. So again, no fantastic happy answer here. Uh, ultimately, some of this will leak. Um, and like I said, text that feels right will be based on the user's corpus because it's supposed to. Um, that's the entire point. But um, uh, you're, it's up to you to figure out how to balance it, how to make sure that um, you are avoiding the, the worst cases of leakage. And look, I cannot stress this enough. If you can't defend it, don't launch it. Uh, uh, if you can't correctly identify your threat model, it is better not existing in the world than having something out there that is hurting uh, people. Uh, let me stress again that building a pipeline, and again, I know I sound like a broken record, is the key here. It, you want to be able to understand that exposure. You want to inject new tools as they become available as fast as you possibly can. Uh, if you are detecting leakage, you want to be able to rebuild that model very, very quickly. And unless you have that built repeatable model or repeatable pipeline, uh, you're going to run into trap challenges. Okay, so summary, uh, MLOps gives you a whole bunch of good stuff. Uh, even outside of security, repeatable workflows, best practices, immutable records. I can't stress that enough. You're always going to want to, at some point in the future, go back and figure out what's going on. Uh, it does require a little bit of human, not a, and sometimes not a little, uh, human and software work. But ultimately, it's really the only way to solve a whole bunch of these problems. Um, and I like to end my every talk with, with something like this. It really is a whole new world out there. Um, uh, the things that you've seen here, machine learning will touch every discipline. There's really no way around that. And it's up to us, the people who are watching this, the software engineers, the data scientists, the machine learning um, uh, SREs, all of us, to, to build solutions uh, that empower the next set of people. We can't ask everyone to get a PhD in statistics. Let's figure out what we can build to empower the frontline people, the uh, home healthcare workers, the uh, real estate individuals, the um, uh, the people looking for bias and, and journalists and things like that. Those are the things that we need to really empower rather than trying to solve these problems ourselves. 
Uh, again, just wrapping up, uh, you will be attacked. Your pipeline will have issues. Uh, the game is all about mitigation of harms and quick recovery. Uh, and so I can't stress that enough. Um, uh, your number one metric should be how fast it takes you to make a change in, either in your data or in your code and have that out in production. Uh, everything else will be kind of secondary, secondary if you can move quickly. And like I said, uh, all of the papers and information are here. Um, you can take your screenshots, you can visit our app, you can ping me on Twitter or at my uh, work email there. Uh, but with that, uh, let's take some questions. Um, okay. I do that's wrong. It uh, doesn't look like we have any questions. Am I misusing this, anyone? Oh, maybe it's over in chat. Nope. Oh, stop my screen share. Got it. All right. Hi, everyone. Oh, summary slide, yes, happy to. Uh, how do I, uh, sorry speakers, can you um, help me? I don't know how to share, not share my screen, but show the uh, slides. Uh, I'll tell you what, I am going to, in the text of the chat, I'm just gonna paste the entire slide in, if that's okay. See if this works. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to do even better. I'm going to, so that you don't have to take screenshots, I'm going to create a gist right now. Should have done this earlier. And we'll paste the gist in. How about? And while I'm doing this over on the side, let's start answering questions. Uh, we'll answer. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, what do I think of AutoML? AutoML is fantastic. Uh, there's no question. I think that the vast majority of uh, work in machine learning right now um, is pretty grunt work. Uh, and so things like AutoML, for those that don't know, AutoML is a, a, a tool that um, lets you uh, uh, walk down an entire set of hyperparameters, explore an entire space simultaneously. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, they're getting to some really advanced stuff where they're doing things like auto pruning, dropouts and so on, really powerful stuff. Um, I think that is critical to this process, but I really think that it is only one part of the process. Um, uh, you know, it, for, it will represent one of those boxes, uh, and there's the gist. Um, uh, it will represent only one of the boxes there. Um, it won't solve all of your other problems, nor should you ever expect it to solve all of those problems. Um, so I would um, uh, certainly add it to your, your overall flow, but I wouldn't say like, this is the end all be all. Um, uh, moving down, am I using AI models to detect leakage? Yeah, you know, um, th that's the dream, uh, you know, put more ML on it. Um, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, you need a large enough data set in order to detect the leakages. Um, and, uh, you know, in order to do that, that just requires this like iterative loop, like you need more and more leakage and so on. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, the, the best papers today, thing, using things like that canary stuff uh, is your best bet. Get yourself a great red team, uh, pay them well, and, and have them attack the hell out of your model and really think about threat models as things, uh, you know, where things are gonna leak through. Um, once you do that, once you identify the places things can leak through, um, implementing things like canaries is pretty straightforward um, and it's really, really powerful technique. Uh, go read that paper, it's, it's fantastic. Um, model drift. Um, yeah, so that's a really, really interesting problem. For those that don't know, model drift is where you have um, uh, tools, or excuse me, you, your, your model was trained on a certain set of information 
And then by the time you roll it out to production or years later, um, you're using the same model that you had originally, but um, uh, it's been trained on out-of-date data. A classic example I like to give is, uh, you know, it's Saturday before a football game uh, and it trains on uh, one thing. And if you're a ticket, you know, seller, uh, your recommendation might be for the, that Sunday's football tickets. Um, but, you know, on Monday, that might be a terrible match for it. Um, the underlying data changed, the underlying reality of the world changed, but the recommendations didn't unless you folded that new stuff. My recommendation here is there's lots of tools, services out there to help you do this. Um, Azure offers a, a data drift as a service. There are lots of other ones out there as well. Um, this is something you really need to build in. And the best thing you can do around data drift is build automated solutions to probe your own model. Um, continually feedback that production data, what people are querying on, and then fill it in. Um, if you don't have that, absolutely, human in the loop is a fantastic bridge. But um, as your data gets bigger and as you do more stuff, um, there's really no way around starting to build automated systems around that. Um, interesting examples of attack systems. Interestingly, everything you saw here was real and live. Um, uh, you know, what you'll commonly see attacked more often than not right now is where the majority of folks are. Uh, images, objects, things like that are very frequently attack systems. Um, but this is a really important bit that I want to stress to everyone. Um, uh, machine learning is just kind of a new iteration, iteration of existing applications. So anything that I was talked about earlier to, or during this talk probably was happening before. It's just obfuscated because it sits behind a black box. Um, are differential privacy measures being adopted in Microsoft products? Um, yes, we, we do offer a number of differential privacy uh, things, and we're going to come out with a whole bunch of architecture around this. Um, but the interesting bit is a lot of the differential privacy stuff happens before uh, any of these products even get into the pipeline. The ideal is that your model is being trained on encrypted data. That's the ideal. Um, and if you're able to accomplish that, then you're off to a good start. Um, uh, you know, as far as, you know, the differential privacy for Microsoft, Microsoft doesn't ever crack your data. We don't look at your data. We have no idea what you're training on whatsoever. Um, so you don't have to worry about us not seeing it. The question is, are you in an industry like HIPAA or other regulated industries where even within your organization, two groups can't see each other's data. Uh, that's something we call eyes off training. There are other uh, techniques for that. And we'll be coming out with a number of architectures uh, around that. Uh, our systems are absolutely built to do that. Um, would I recommend adversarial hardening? Um, absolutely. I mean, like, I would throw everything you, you have here and more. Um, that said, the, your hardening, your threat modeling shouldn't be a black box. The idea that you just say, hey, you know what, here's this model. I went out and spent $100,000 on this company to you know, attack my endpoint, and it came back with no results. That is a terrible solution. Um, uh, you, know, you shouldn't feel secure just because it came back with terrible results. They don't know your system as well as you do. The best thing you can do is get real trained red team humans in there thinking about threat models, thinking about how to attack. And then and only then, once you see where your biggest threats are, um, that's when you start building automated tooling and more sophisticated things like adversarial hardening. In. Um, do I recommend ML ops for ML models that are used internally for a community? Um, absolutely. Uh, if you're not using ML ops today, but your model is in production, we should have a talk because that is really bad. Um, ML ops gives you a repeatable pipeline. If someone is doing a training, you know, in Jupiter on your laptop, throwing the weights over the wall and just saying, go to work, you are going to have a bad time. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. Um, it's brutal. Uh, building in standard tooling around building and reproducing and rolling out models is critical. And that's what MLOps is. What you saw there was not any brand new software other than your standard CICD tooling, but it was doing CICD with an awareness that this is machine learning specific, that we are going to run this, you know, based on data updates or based on code updates and so on and so forth. So that's what's really incredible, uh, powerful. Uh, are there any explainability platforms? There aren't platforms right now, but, uh, and again, uh, forgive my bias, um, some folks at Microsoft in the Azure group have come out with interpret ML. 
a wonderful, completely open source um, SDK that is available anywhere uh, that is under MIT license, so you can use it in any product you like. Um, and it's uh, it's something you're able to download, throw in a container, and just drop it in a pipeline. Uh, and we'll be coming out with some really cool actions around that as well uh, that you saw here. Um, can recommendation systems get hacked? Absolutely. Again, anything where you are leaking through the private data you have been trained on, absolutely. It is incredibly up to you. But again, let me stress, uh, if you haven't already done this threat model analysis and the red team analysis, you're already being attacked today. Even if you're nowhere near ML models, you're being attacked. Build your threat models, understand what's going on, and you'll be in the best position for uh, defense and for building into the future. And I guess that's it. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just throw this up one more time. Uh, with that, thank you very much for everything. Uh, all the slides will be available. And like I said, if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, please email me at any of these uh, places, uh, email, Twitter, um, or just visit our website and you can check it out for yourself. Thank you so much.